welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Frontier Gentlemen. Original air date's August 31st, 1958, and the title is Bell Sudden Strikes Back. Let's get into it, and I hope you enjoy. It's a never-ending source of amazement to me what a woman will do for or to a man. This happened in Dakota Territory. <laughs> Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just a moment, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Not just a news program, but a clever, concise focus on the world tonight, seven nights a week on CBS Radio. Listen to the world tonight, reporting odd, stimulating, and important sidelights to the day's events. Hear CBS News round up the stories behind the news, frequently in the voices of the newsmakers themselves. Seven nights a week on most of these stations, CBS Radio presents... The World Tonight. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. The lady I knew as Belle Siddons had brought her gambling establishment to Deadwood. And as I had reason to know, where went Miss Siddons, so followed trouble. This remarkable and very pretty woman had once been a Confederate spy. In the years following the war, she had married, been widowed, and after spending a short time as a tutor at the Red Cloud Indian Agency, she drifted into gambling, becoming one of the most skillful 21 dealers in the West. Belle, or Madame Verdi, as she called herself in Deadwood, was playing a very dangerous game. This was impressed upon me by a peace officer named Boone May. I was sitting in his office the morning after he had learned of a planned stagecoach holdup. You get to talk to Madame Verdi last night, Kendall? I spoke to her. She say anything? About what? You know about what? Stage holdup is supposed to be on for tonight. Well, she knows there's going to be one, that's all. What would she say about McLaughlin? Nothing much. I told her you thought they were planning the robbery together. What'd she say? She laughed. Huh? That's so. And then she said she'd told you the truth. No, one of her casemen had heard a gold shipment was going to be stopped between here and Rapid City. She doesn't know who's going to do it. The way things are between her and McLaughlin, I wouldn't figure her square. Did you? If she's really in love with him, I don't imagine she'd want to see him caught. Well, I'm going to find out. That's for sure. How? Well, I'll tell you, Kendall. It wouldn't be smart me getting mouthy about what I aim to do until it's time to do it. You being a newspaper feller and all, you savvy? <laughs> you afraid I'll tell Madame Verdi? Well, now, I ain't exactly afraid, but I ain't over-anxious neither. See... I've been living in Deadwood long enough to know it ain't smart to put trust in any man or a woman. Maybe that's how come I'm still living. Yeah, I suppose in your job it's the safest way. Yeah, that's right. What about this Archie McLaughlin? You haven't met him? No. Well, he's real polite. Good-natured young feller. At least ways that's the way you figure him to be. Then you find out he fought with Quantrell's raiders on the Kansas border in the war. I ain't kept track of his killing since then, but they say there's uh, four or more he shot down here and other places. Well, he's a road agent, spends most of what he steals gambling. But if you know his record, why haven't you arrested him? Well, I know what I hear tell. I ain't got proof. That's what I need. Maybe tonight that's what I'm going to get. I'd like to be there when you do. Yeah, I guess you ain't got a good feeling toward him at that, him taking Madame Verdi from you. <laughs> You insist there's a great romance between the lady and me, don't you? 
I heard things was a simmer. A uh, false rumor. How come you're so interested in McLaughlin, then? That's part of my job. I'm a newspaper correspondent, remember? Yeah. All right, Kettle, you come back here this evening, say about six o'clock, maybe I'll have something for you to write about in that London paper of yours. I spent the rest of the day in my hotel room sorting out notes and preparing outlines of future articles. At six o'clock, precisely, I returned to Boone May's office. He was buckling on a gun belt, smiled at me in his mirthless way as I walked in. You all set, huh? Yes. You seen the madam again? No. I know you ain't. I had somebody watching just in case. <laughs> Javert. Huh? A French policeman. man by the name of Victor Hugo wrote about him. You have a great deal in common. Oh. You got a gun? Yes. That's fine. Come on. Where are we going? Oh, well, down to the stage station. Going to take a little trip. When we reached the station, I saw a coach with five heavily armed men standing near it. Each carried a rifle and holstered guns. Boone May nodded to them. All set, boys? We got on oh, this fellow's candle. He's riding with us to see the fun. Gold come in yet? Yeah, we already loaded it, Boone. All right, let's get going, then. Sam, you drive. Uh, Davenport, you ride shotgun. The rest of us be inside. Uh, go ahead, Kendall, after you. All right, right you are. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's kind of tight squeeze to all the artillery. Now, come on, boys. Get the rifles on the floor. We won't have no use for them for a while. All right, let's go, Sam. You think it's safe to tell me about it now? Sure. No harm now. Now, this here is a regular coach for Rapid City. Instead of the company driver and guards, these are my men. Yes, I gathered that. Oh, uh, see that box on the seat? Uh, yes. 50,000 in gold. Uh, that's what we're going to be stopped for. Ah. Don't mind a little shooting, do you? I don't imagine I'll have much choice, will I? That's a human fact. Oh, say, uh, uh, Kettle, that there French fella, the law dog. Javert? Yeah. Uh, was he a good one? I suppose in some ways you could say he was. Gunslinger? No. He didn't have to be. Uh, we may have a fairish long ride. Uh, how's about you tell me more about it? Uh, uh, how'd you say that name again? Javert. Javert. Henry Morgan is head man on CBS Radio's bright, bouncy Sunday night quiz called Says Who? Mr. Morgan's noted scimitar wit sets the stage for a guessing game that's sheer delight for players and listeners alike. The idea is for the stars to guess whose voices are being played for their ears. You may beat the players to the punch, or you and they may be tied up in hilarious knots later on today over most of these stations. Play along with Henry Morgan and company in CBS Radio's Says Who? It may appear odd, but at the time there seemed nothing particularly strange about recounting a condensation of Hugo's Les Miserables to Boone May and his deputies. I suppose I'm becoming used to the peculiarities of my life in the West. One accepts anything, even the gleam in a peace officer's eye as he compares himself to the dedicated bloodhound, Javert. May's deputies listened, respectful, silent. I finished the story. Well, now, I'd say that was a man who believed in the law. Uh, wouldn't you say that, boys? Sure was. Yes, sir. Oh, I like that word you used, Kettle. Dedicated. All right, there's a fine word. What's the matter, Sam? Cottonwood tree falling across the road. All right, stay where you are, Sam. Might be natural, might not. Up with him. Get down off the coach, both of you. Four, dead. five of them. 
Passengers, come on, outside. Me and Ken will go outside as soon as we hit the ground. You three start shooting. All right, come on, Ken. When I tell you to you drop, you do I it quickly. You won't have no back left to your head. All right. As well, hold on to them horses. Right. Billy, you cover the passengers. Here are. Archie McLaughlin. Where? If it ain't Boone May. Don't you do it! For about five seconds, the moonlit clearing thundered to the sound of gunfire. And then it was all over. Lying on the ground was the man named Caswell, a bullet through his head. The four other hold-up men were racing away on their horses. One, we could see, had been wounded as he held desperately to the horn of his saddle. We took Caswell's body back with us to Deadwood. And then Boone May suggested a drink. He led me to a saloon which stood a few doors away from Madame Verdi's gambling tent. You know why we come to this place, Kendall? I have a faint idea. I want to see the madam's face when I tell her. Well, what makes you think she'll come here? Oh, she will. Two of the boys are going to bring her in. Are you arresting her? Not right now. I just want to see her face. Uh, maybe it'll tell me if she needs arresting. You still think she knew about the holdup? She might. Oh, there she is. Now, I'll be obliged you don't say nothing outside of Hello Candle. I'll take it as real unfriendly if you do, Savvy. Perhaps I better go. There's no such thing. Well, now, Madam Verdi, this is sure a pleasure. Is it? Good evening, Mr. Kendall. Madam Verdi? Am I under arrest, Mr. May? Of course you ain't. These two men didn't give me much choice. I had to leave my table. There's a big game going on. Well, then, madam, you better get right back to it. There was nothing important I had to say. I'll see you in the morning. If it was so unimportant, why did you have me brought here? Well, I never said to the boys to bring you, madam. I told them to ask you, polite. I surely do apologize for the inconvenience. Oh, uh, uh, by the way, there'll be some company money at the office for you tomorrow. Oh? Yeah, that holdup you told us about. You was right. They tried it a while back, and we plugged one for good. Another's bad hurt. Three got away. We'll get them. Who were they? Archie McLaughlin and some of his boys. Oh. Yeah. Well, madam, like I said, I sure am sorry for the trouble getting you over here. That's all right, Mr. May. I understand why you did. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. Kendall. Uh, I'll walk back with you to your place if you don't mind. Not at all. Uh, you have no objection. Oh, shucks, no, you go right ahead. Oh, I dropped around in the morning, Kendall. Uh, maybe I'll have some more news for you. Who was it? Who was killed? A man named Caswell. I don't think it was McLaughlin who was hurt, but I'm not certain. May wanted to find out what I knew about it. That's why he didn't tell me who the dead man was, isn't it? That mostly, I think. And he enjoyed watching me. I expect so. Were you there during the holdup? Yes. Archie's such a fool. Why didn't he tell me? You didn't know he was going to do it? Of course not. Well, Boone May will be watching you now, you know that. He'll expect you to get in touch with McLaughlin or McLaughlin to try to reach you. Shall you be watching me too? Is that why you came with me? You think I'm on Boone May's side? I've known newspaper men before. The story's the important thing, isn't it? Not to that extent. I have to get back now. <laughs> Money waiting to be won? Yes. Before you go, may I ask you something? You're not angry with me about Archie? No. Not jealous? No. Most men would be. I know, but I have no reason. It was just something that was rather nice and right between us. That's all. Will you let me know if you'll hear anything about him? Yes. <laughs> you know, I'd be much wiser to fall in love with a man like you. Good night. Good night. 
What forces are at work? Who are the central figures? How do the people involved feel and think as schools and communities move towards desegregation? These questions are uppermost in the minds of Americans in every part of the country. Tonight on CBS Radio, you will hear the answers as most of these same stations present Virginia Pattern of Resistance. Narrated by Walter Cronkite, Virginia Pattern of Resistance is another special study by CBS News that goes right to the heart of what's happening. For the next few days, I saw Bell Siddons from time to time, but never for more than a few minutes, and then it was usually on the street or in her gambling establishment. If Boone May expected me to be the unwitting liaison between Bell and Archie McLaughlin, he must have been disappointed. There had been no word concerning McLaughlin or his companions. Then, one night, I had just returned to my hotel room. Yeah. Get inside. Don't make no noise, mister. You carrying a gun? Well, it, it's hanging up over there. Now, sit down. All right. I'll tell you the straight of it. My name is Billy Mansfield. Oh. J.B. I know Ken- you're Kendall. Archie says you know Madam Verde. Archie? McLaughlin? Yeah. He sent me to find her. I think one of Boone May's boys spotted me when I came into town. I figured if I couldn't get through to the madam, you would. Well, what makes you think that? Archie says you're a friend of Madame Verdi's, that's why. Oh. I recognize you now. You were with McLaughlin in that holdup, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Listen, one of the boys, John Brown, he's like to cash in his chips any minute. One of the shots got him plumb through the belly. Has he had a doctor? He ain't no doctor we could trust around. Archie wants the madam to come and do something. What could she do? Get the bullet out. Archie says she knows about doctoring. You can't ask her to do that. Not a man with a bullet in his stomach. He needs a doctor. Mister, I ain't here to argue with you. Will you get the message to the madam? Supposing I go to Boone May. Ain't no skin off my saddle if you do. I won't be here when you get back. Besides, you being a friend of madam, you wouldn't want to see her get in no trouble. What's the message? Tell her to come to the place she and Archie went. The start of the timber road. She'll know where it is. If she ain't alone, one of us will get her before they get us. Archie didn't say that, but I'm saying it, Kendall. Supposing I come with her? That's your business. When is she supposed to go? Tonight. As soon as she can. We'll be waiting. You'll be taking a big risk, Bell. If Boone May finds out, you know it'll happen. I've got to go. Why? It's not McLaughlin. He's not been wounded. No. But he asked me to. That's enough. All right. I'll come with you. No. Yes. I'll be safe. I'm sure you will. But if Boone May sees you ride out alone, he may be suspicious. If we go together, let him think what he wants. You don't have to do that for McLaughlin. I'm not. I'm doing it for myself. I want to write the story. Bell Siddons and I drove out of Deadwood in a buckboard. And to any casual or inquisitive onlooker, we had all the appearances of a romantic couple enjoying a midnight drive. As far as I could tell, we weren't following. This is it. Oh. 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 You better go back. Leave me alone. I'll get back to Deadwood, all right. No, I'd rather not. You've done enough? I've told you, Bell. This is the kind of thing that earns me a living. Besides, I'm rather curious to meet your Archie McLaughlin. Bell? Yes? Who's that with you? Mr. Kendall. Were you followed? I don't think so. This is McLaughlin, Kendall. I thank you for what you've done. Now you better get on back to Deadwood. You trusted me to get the message through for you. Why not let me stay? I'll see she gets back safely. You come into the timber with us, you take your own chances of getting out. I ain't sitting to argue. Follow me up the road. We drove along the diminishing road for 15 minutes until it became nothing more than a deep, rutted trail and then was too narrow for our buckboard. McLaughlin swung Bell Siddons onto his horse. I followed behind. Another five minutes took us to a ramshackle shanty deep in the woods. A dim glow shone from inside. Now she's here, boys. Who's the fella? Name of Kendall. I told you he said he'd come. Don't give up easy, does he? Ain't nothing you can do. 
Better to put him out of his misery. Let me see. Sure looks ugly, don't it? Mm. Can you do anything? I don't know. How long's it been? Ten days. Well, I can't make him any worse than he is. You could kill him. He should have been dead days ago. Archie, find me a piece of wire. I've got to get the bullet out. Yeah. Jack, Billy, take a look around. Have you ever done this before? No. But I study dissection with my husband. I've taken bullets out, but not like that. I'm afraid I'll be no help. Mm -hmm. Bring the lamp over here, will you? Right. Put it on the floor here. I'd rather operate on that table, but I'm afraid to move him. What do you think? I'd better do it here. I found the wire. Give it to Mr. Kendall. Oh. Hold it over the flame. All right. Belle Sittens, ex-Confederate spy, gambler, doctor's wife. With that single piece of wire, she probed the terrible wound and extracted the bullet. And the man lived. She smiled at me at McLaughlin. I think I'd better go, Archie. Yeah. Uh, you think he'll make it? He's got a chance. Hey, wait a minute. You ain't thinking of having her and this Kendall fella going back to Deadwood, are you? Well, why not? Why not? So as they can tell Boone May where we're hiding at? Well, Madame Verdi is hardly likely to. And I have no reason to. I'm not a lawman. I ain't for letting him go, Arch. Jack's right. It ain't safe. Now, look, she came as a favor to me. A favor to Johnny. And he's still alive, ain't he? Don't matter. She'll tell or he will. I say plug him now. Uh, I'd rather you didn't, gentlemen. Oh, put away your gun, Kendall. There's no call for shooting. Leastwise, not between us. I say you and Madam here, you both go. I figure neither one of you will do any talking. Now, ain't that so? You know, Archie. How about you, Kendall? <laughs> I'm rather fond of the lady, too. I don't think I want to see her strung up to a cottonwood limb as an accessory. No. I won't do any talking. Hey, you hear that, Jack? Billy? Now we're going to let him out of here. Quiet and peaceable. Any killing to be done, you'll have to draw on me. Will I see you again, Archie? Sure you will, honey. Don't you worry. I'll be around real soon. Old Johnny there, he can't thank you yet, but I sure do. And one of these days, I'll prove it. So long, honey. I drove Bell Siddons back to Deadwood. Our escapade had apparently gone unnoticed, which was just as well. Because a rather unusual message awaited me at my hotel, which I shall write about in my next report to the London Times. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Gene Lansworth, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, William Allen, and Jack Moyles. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman, Bud Sewell speaking.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.